sorry I can't be with you today, but um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to present this via video. Um, I want to talk about some thoughts um, that developed out of my work in early prehistory, looking at artifact scatters and thinking about how in early human evolution people interacted with the residues of their own behaviour in landscapes as well as those of other people. Um, I hope this is of relevance beyond very early human evolution where we're just dealing with uh, artifacts and uh, certainly it's led me to start thinking about the way more purposeful placement of stones in the landscape may have played a role in our social interaction with each other and our social use of landscapes and especially thinking about how stones and landscapes working together with our capacity to uh, invoke others, to invoke stories and to encode landscapes with information um, leave uh, potentially very complex and rich traces of uh, past human behaviour in our prehistoric landscape. Inspiration for this work really comes from the 1960s and 70s work of Glenn Isaac working on um, early Pleistocene artifact scatters at sites uh, such as Olegasele um, and in West Kano, where Glenn Isaac was trying to get to grips with what do the fundamental uh, particles of our, uh, of our research stone tools mean when we find them either in isolation or in different configurations. He tried to get to grips with the texture of archaeological uh, signatures um, contrasting the dense patches which may represent particularly long-lived activity areas with the background scatters of isolated artifacts. And dealing with uh, the texture of the archaeological record in what he described as the scatters and patches um, terrain of, uh, of artifact distribution in extensive paleo land surfaces. It became obsessed with wondering what is the fundamental particle that we need to deal with to understand past human behaviour. Is it the uh, individual artefact representing the gesture of removal from a core, potentially use as a tool to discard, or should we be scaling up to seeing how different artefacts work together in other units, such as a particular reduction sequence of a tool or a group of artefact scatters relating to human behaviour? And the important thing is these things are scalable, and they're scalable in time. I think that the artifact itself, the individual um, slave, the individual tool, is the fundamental particle. Because only by looking at the dynamics and life history of individual artifacts, as part of a wider sets of the napping scatter, the site and the landscape, can we really build up the full range of dynamics, both uh, in terms of human behaviour and in terms of the taxonomic processes that might be obscuring a correct interpretation. We are well equipped as archaeologists to try and imagine how these artefacts play roles in the social and ecological behaviour of hominid groups in deep time. Our entire discipline is uh, built on identifying artefacts within landscapes and through correct interpretation and reading of that record, bring into focus agency on an individual level and group dynamics over short term and longer term time scales. That's the fundamental part of what we do. That's a fundamentally archaeological uh, process, that reading and that interpretation. So we routinely work from identifying artefacts within a landscape, understanding their context, creating a very detailed record of their uh, relationship to each other and their relationship to uh, depositional, uh, depositional frameworks, and from that reconstruct larger units of behaviour, whether you know, through refitting a napping scatter or whether through looking at extended chain off retoire, the way that the lithics are giving indications of other aspects of behaviour, use of organic materials, interaction with the environment and wider uh, social groupings and social complexity. In this stepwise way, 
we invoke past human behavior, we invoke past human agents and agency. And this is effectively the ultimate goal and the ultimate product of our our reconstructions of uh, past human behavior as well are directly triggered by our engagement with these objects. We are not immune from these same processes which would have acted upon our very early ancestors. We go from moving in landscapes, identifying and recognizing objects as potentially being the result of human agency, um, where there's consensus in that, we can sometimes harness huge resources and we can harness our own networks, whether those networks are social or academic or economic, to bring to bear a huge amount of human activity. You know, consider the trigger of finding an artifact in a particular context and thinking of its significance, either an artifact in an area where we didn't know humans were present or at a time um, where we didn't know humans were making artifacts and what that sets in train. A huge amount of social and economic complexity takes place through engagement with that, uh, with that artifact. And this leads to an enormous amount of modification of the landscape, of the artifacts, of reconfiguration of, the, of our social and academic networks and a huge amount of focus. This is a fundamental part of our discipline. And I think in some ways it informs just how potent these objects within landscapes could have been in the past to triggering and reconfiguring behavior. Our reconstructions of the past are no more than shadowy ghosts that have been invoked from a very basic record looked at in a very sophisticated um, way. But this invocation of others from static, isolated, and sometimes long discarded material is something we instinctually do. We instinctually do it outside of archaeology. We do it moving into a room, looking at the objects around, decoding behaviors that may have happened there before. It's a way that we fundamentally as humans, with a very well developed sense of, uh, of uh, social complexity and understanding the relationship between material objects and potential social scenarios constantly deep environments. Where we're dealing with very complicated sites where sometimes we have tens of thousands of fundamental particles, we need to rely on a huge multidisciplinary approach to you know, filter out all the background noise of taponomic processes, geological processes, overprinting of behavioral signatures to bring those individual uh, processes into focus. But we can do this instantly and instinctually working through you know, complex urban environments in our day-to-day -day life. We are constantly decoding these objects and their significance through their juxtaposition, through any indication of timeline and time depth. We're now capable in lithic analysis and in decoding the nuts and bolts of our record, which is stone tools, of actually pulling out time depth. What I like to think of as the, the red shift of the lithic scatter. The scatters and patches maps that we're able to create from our surveys within landscapes are not two-dimensional maps of past human behavior, nor are they three-dimensional maps of uh, landscape use within um, a, you know, a single time block. They are fully four-dimensional products of humans moving in space, interacting with each other, and interacting, re interacting with their own material traces. Therefore, these traces are in constant shift prior to sealing in the sedimentary system. And we have to be aware of just how complex those transforming. We need to see that in an artifact scatter or a ritual landscape that contains field monuments, stone alignments, stone circles, these landscapes are built up over time. They are projects that are never complete and always in flux and always have the potential to change. 
And any change, any modification is happening in direct response to the triggers that are already there within the land. So Glyn Isaacs, scatters and patches, although they're also, they are genuinely a good way of describing spatial variation, are also a great way of describing temporal variation. Simply put, first movements into a landscape may end up leaving a background trace, but over time, certain parts of the landscape may become a focus for activity and end up with denser patch concentrations. These themselves may act as a pull and a focus for even increased intensity of working, leading to mega sites where tens of thousands of artifacts are found. We need to get to grips with mysterious structures like the, the DK stone circle. Is it, uh, is, it, is it a structure as was originally thought, maybe an early hut-like structure, or is it just an accumulation of material around a tree where people found a shady affordance and kept on coming back to again and again? I think in some ways the overall interpretation, while important, is a secondary consideration to the fact that a particular behavior, a particular trigger in that behavior leads to a compelling, concentrated, and apparently self-organized distribution of stone artifacts at one place in the landscape. And I think this is the fundamental uh, phenomenon that we should be looking at. The tendency where a landscape is long-lived and particles are moving as part of human social and ecological patterns for even at an early stage, over two million years ago, for very organized patterns to begin to emerge. We also need to think about these patterns of intense concentration as providing affordances. If you have a landscape which is putting people back again and again over a long period of time, acting as a draw and then allowing dense concentrations to persist, then those dense concentrations of material themselves have a utility. They're a source of raw material. They're a source of tools that are, can essentially be recycled. They act as a marker in the landscape showing human occupation patterns. They potentially encode very basic information about the resources and behaviors that took place there before. But if you've got a hominin that's capable of decoding that information, is an information resource in itself. In this sense, as these concentrations increase, what we may be seeing is a form of niche construction, actually enabling and enhancing the human use of space as these uh, effectively cultural landscapes start to develop a texture and a folk. I've talked about these things a couple of times before with relevance to um, the Ashleyan, thinking about how highly structured um, discard environments may have acted as an advantage in early stages of human evolution. Here's a couple of quotes. Where environmental conditions remain stable, biface rich signatures would have marked optimal locales for resource exploitation, allowing basic information to be transmitted. Um, later on, just as these areas signal specific patterns of group behavior to the archeologist, even basic associative reinforcement would have marked such sites as socially significant to hominin groups. I do not believe early hominins developing um, social complexity, developing an evolutionary path that was tightly enmeshed and entangled with this technology would have disregarded and ignored that technology as a source of information. We can see in the archaeological record, and we test this by looking for direct interaction, a paper um, Adam Brum and um, myself and Matt Larez got, got coming out soon, looks very specifically at patterns of reuse and resharpening in large artifact accumulations where artifacts have a chance to weather in the landscape before being picked up and reused. This is a passive utility, probably, but it's a utility nonetheless, giving an adaptive advantage to any hominid that's concentrating just the tools they need within a landscape um, where perhaps those raw materials are not very easily available. So I liked to muse that once we started um, leaving stone tools in large numbers in the landscape, we'd crossed a kind of threshold. 
in calling it today the Hansel and Gretel threshold. The primates have a large range of organic tools that they draw on. These are things that are going to be very fragile and very easily subjected to diagenesis and rotting and dispersal. And we know that when Hansel and Gretel were trying to make sense of their environment, when they were using organic markers, like trails of bread that got eaten by the birds, they were in a very perilous situation. They couldn't make sense of it. When we started using stone tools, we were starting to use more durable markers. Now, we've got an archaeological record of percussive stone technology going back 3.3 million years ago. It's anyone's guess when early primates started using stone tools for activities like cracking nuts. But as soon as you've got this more durable, more resilient marker in the landscape, just like Hansel and Gretel's trails of pebbles, you suddenly have something you can tangibly work with. And I think once we started leaving these durable traces, at least the possibility for interaction with them and co-evolution with these traces was possible, leaving potentially quite visible and durable markers of our movement, our recombination, our exploitation. If this is right, and we follow through the logic here, that humans are leaving durable traces, and they're interacting with them, and they're triggering changes in behavior, then what we effectively have is a process of stigmergy occurring. Stigmergy is a process of indirect communication and learning by the environment which we find in social insects. Ants um, provide a really good case study. They leave pheromone traces, which other uh, uh, ant individuals interact with, pick up very simple information from, and then redirect their own behavior. We don't leave scent traces. We don't go marking up against trees or leaving powerful pheromones saying, I've just found a food resource. But how do we decode? Well, I think the simplest way we decode is by using our um, visual capabilities and by semiosis, by looking at visible signs in the landscape, whether that be uh, you know, simple trail markers like footprints or broken twigs or a blood trail, um, or more complex con intentional markers, fully semiotic, culturally aware markers in the landscape. Semiosis is something we do incredibly. It ants, it underpins very complex uh, social structures, uh, very complex patterns of foraging and recombination and, and resource sharing. Um, and in humans, so our very complex urban environments, the way we move around them, the way we organize traffic, public transport, pedestrian movement, finding resources, finding our way to and from our places of living, are entirely encoded through very overt um, signs and signals. And semiosis is the way that we make sense and perform the miracle of self-organization. If we look back into the archaeological record, we may be seeing some of the individual steps towards this incredible capacity through our interaction with durable markers of our past behavior left in the landscape, markers that we still hone in on very quickly and very easily and find significant today. Seen in this point in time, these densely structured accumulations of material are an amplification of an underlyingly valuable. But I don't want us to think that we're kind of just like zombies blindly uh, just responding to triggers in landscapes. The way we undertake semiosis is actually embedded in one of our other great adaptations. And it's not something that we're carrying out mindlessly. Our large brains, as we envisage from the uh, social brain hypothesis developed within human evolutionary studies by Robin Dunbar, Clive Gamble, and John Gowlett, sees the development of social cognition as underpinning the development of so much in the human brain and so much of our capacity to organize as very complex uh, uh, social groups within landscapes. And it's this social cognition that I think stands a good for being extended to decoding 
our material landscapes and if there is something significant about objects in landscapes once they start being placed intentionally it's not necessarily just there the intention behind the original placement of a stone or the original erection of a monument but it's about the potential it has for reinvention and transformation raise a stone in a landscape drop a significant object and it has a gravity a gravity that attracts human attention attracts stories attracts information it rapidly has the potential therefore to increase encoding <coughs> of those relationships and i think seeing the stories and myths and social information as a dark matter that we can never fully know but we can almost detect by its uh, uh, its presence and potential uh, to exist within landscapes provides a model for thinking about uh, our landscapes as being fields of differential gravity. In this sense, I think we should pay attention to myths and folklore that are attached to places and to objects and to prehistoric structures within the landscape, because I believe they are directly analogous, if however corrupt and fragmented, to the kinds of information that could be encoded in, and see it as a spontaneous arising of a very natural interaction from a heavily developed, extended social cognition that's part of our evolutionary uh, uh, legacy, and the traces we leave on the landscape through both incidental and purposeful construction. I'll stop there, and thank you.